there's something about this morning that he wants us to know. His presence is to be cherished and sought for. His presence may not always be found where in an expression that I'm comfortable with. I'm a product, and many of us are, of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements of the past. And I was in part like all others that you train to come into the courtyard with thanksgiving and then you go into the holy place and then you get to the holy of holies. And that was all right for its season. But one thing the Lord told us was, you let me be the leader. Sometimes he has in mind something quiet and still. Sometimes it's loud and boisterous and yay really makes our body feel good like we've really worshiped and then sometimes it's like this morning let me lead let Kathy lead what's echoing in me let Kathy lead follow me don't start something loud and boisterous I'm not in that right now I'll bring that on another season and another day and there are times we gather and we're a little fuller at that time and it's a hallelujah glory to you and she can hardly keep up with her guitar. But then there are mornings like this morning when he says, and I did, I prayed over the chairs and I prayed in the space yesterday, Lord, may your presence just overwhelm us. And he did. And therefore, he led a different way, a healing way. So even our worship can't be programmed. <laughs> when we gather, we, we don't know. We don't know what he's going to do. And the expression of his people is beautiful. Whether anyone else can hear you or not, you're expressing to him. Opening your mouth and expressing to him is beautiful to him. But he was moving among us and bringing glory to his name as we worshiped. Years ago, a good number of years ago, I had tachycardia very, very badly. They thought it was all super tachycardia. It didn't turn out to be that way, but, but that's what I was treated for. And I, I, there was no cure for it when it was discovered. And it was really deep debilitating me. I mean, if I woke up with that, I thought I was having a heart attack. Everything was like that. And I would end up in the emergency ward and they would try everything. And Gerda got to take a picture of my brain one time. <laughs> and all, she said, you have gray matter. I said, I'm comforted. <laughs> but all of that I am to say is that my physician at the time was the dear Christian lady. And she said, Iris, right now there's no cure. So you have to not be you have to not allow your adrenaline to rise because that's what's setting it off how does a Pentecostal woman not let her adrenaline rise when she's preaching I mean it's just, and I looked at her she was not charismatic and I looked at her and I said that's almost impossible for me how in the world can I do that but I, I learned and I, I went to the Lord with it and I said father how in the world and he said learn the difference between your excitement and my spirit. If the spirit's leading excitement, it will heal you. If you're excited in your flesh and you substitute that for what I'm doing in spirit, you've not read me well. Now there's no condemnation in that. It's just that we often don't read him well. So I've learned when I hear people get excited when they're teaching and preaching, I listen. Is it spirit or is it them being excited? And it's given me a discernment that I treasure. 
And there was, not long after that, a, a gentleman who came to the church I was attending at the time, and he was a missionary. He had never been one before, but he was out of college, and he and his wife were going to a foreign land, and they came seeking funds to go. And so he preached that morning, and he was one of the most enthusiastic preachers I've ever heard. And I sat there absolutely still because there was no spirit in that excitement. He didn't know. He was excited, but... The spirit wasn't excited yet. And so um, most of the people did not know that. And so they got excited with him. But it was just interesting that Jesus walked with me there and taught me some things. That when it's not a time for excitement, then let it be still. Let the worship be genuinely still within the people. And then when the Lord gets it excited... And sometimes we head for, let's get them all excited, you know. Then the offering will be great, and then they'll be excited in their, in their spirits. Well, maybe not, but they'll be excited. It's like a ball game, but it's not a ball game. This is not a ball game. This is worship. And our, our, our yells and our screams have to be of a different nature. So we, We're learning. We're all learning, but be comforted. He was very blessed this morning. I felt the blessing of the Lord, and I'm, I'm going to be teaching in that, all right? Just this was a little addition. Lord, we do praise you for our time together, and we thank you that you are in charge here. And I lay down preconceived ideas, and I choose to follow you and what you've assigned us to look at. So, Lord, lead us. Lead us as we listen. Lead us as we read. Lead us as we allow you to give us those mysteries and things we know nothing yet about that are ahead for us. Age makes no difference. Placement in life makes no difference. You are the difference. So, Lord, we, we lean and we thank you. So, good morning, everybody. I'm on. I should be on. So I um, <clears throat> thought it would just be good if I shared a little bit, and then instead of having to go around and repeat this story a half dozen times this morning, <clears throat> um, it has to do with the reason I've got sweatpants on. Um, it seems I had a severe disagreement with my lower back. Um, it was precipitated by three days of processing a tree that I cut up and split up and with Laura's parents and got it out. And a day and a half later, I was leaning over the kitchen sink, and, I, and my back went into spasm and I was on the floor. <clears throat> so it took me an hour to get from the bathroom onto the couch where I stayed until the next morning when I thought, well, I've got to go <clears throat> because nature calls and I thought I would try to get up. I got four feet from the couch and I couldn't move. So with the help of Laura's father who came over, um, I was... Uh, an hour later, I was able to get back on the couch, and I stayed there um, for another two days. So it was about four days total. So <clears throat> the Lord told me he was going to heal me. And, you know, sometimes when he says I'm going to heal you, he heals you by supernaturally by his spirit. Sometimes he sends you somebody. Sometimes when you ask for a word from the Lord, you hear it in your spirit, and sometimes he sends you somebody. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get an Ananias when, you, when you're blind. You know, he'll send, you, he'll send someone to you. So <clears throat> I, Tuesday after spending about an hour and a half on the floor total, and there is some not seemly details there I'll just leave out as to all that have transpired now on the floor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I thought you'd appreciate <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, I'll let you, you can just run that with your own imaginations. Um, I called, um, it came to me that I should call my chiropractor, whom I haven't seen in years. And he drove out to the house on Wednesday to give me a, tr to give me a treatment, to evaluate me. Wow. Um, the next day he came out on Thanksgiving Day. He loaded his 70 pound treatment machine into his van and drove out and gave me a treatment. 
It took five minutes to take the treatment. And he walked around the couch and he said, you, he said, you need to get up. He said, because if you don't, you're going to have to go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I got up with his help and I walked around. And all of a sudden I could sit up. I couldn't sit up on the couch. And I got up and I walked around and I was able to use the facilities and that was nice. That's good. <laughs> it's amazing what you take for granted when you can't do it anymore. <laughs> and um, then by Friday, I looked at Lauren and said, I'm not sitting on this couch today. So I got myself up off the couch and, um, and that was the end of the bedpan. And I went to the bathroom every single time that day and I did not lay down on the couch. I, w- I was done with laying down on the couch. I'd had enough. So I sat and I got up several times during the day and I walked. And the more I moved, the better I was. So by Saturday, I was able to make the trip to Syracuse to get another treatment, spent the day with her parents. And I'm here today. And I'm moving and I'm walking. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Bless and you. We appreciate you, Lord. Yes. And all of that to say that what precipitated the, the vision that I had last night. And I hope this will fit in with what you're speaking about. I'm sure it will find. I, I hope. I had a vision last night, and it was a very short, very simple vision. There was a, a stream or a creek or a river, and it was probably only, I don't know, maybe, maybe as wide as this room, maybe 30 feet wide. And there was a big tree by the river, and the river was flowing, but it was, um, it was a calm river, but there was current. And the, the tree, this big tree, it was, looked like a big maple tree or something, big, at the, big at, at the base, just fell into the river. And it blocked the river. And the Spirit said to me, when an obstruction falls in a river, it changes direction. Because the water's got to go somewhere. God allows obstructions to fall in our path so that we will change direction. God allows trauma. He allows, and this is necessary so that we will make the big life changes that we need to make that we've been procrastinating on, that we know we need to make. But, you know, we don't like change. So the Lord led me through some of the things that happened in the Bible, where there were dramatic things that happened that changed the course of events or got people to change direction. And he started out with Elijah in the mountain. And <clears throat> I reread that section. There's some things I hadn't seen before. There was a fire. We know about the fire. We know about the earthquake. The wind was very interesting to me because this was such a wind, it says it actually broke pieces of the mountain off. Can you imagine such a wind to break things off the mountain? And it was necessary because God had to get Elijah's attention because he was of a certain mindset at that point in time. I, Lord, I'm the only one. And the Lord had to change his mind. But he had to get his attention first. And so he caused all these things to happen, and the Lord wasn't in, in, in any of them. And Elijah, and then finally the Lord spoke to him and said, you know, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm the only one. He said, yeah, but there's 7,000 left. And it got Elijah to change course, got him to change his mind. Because sometimes God wants you to change your mind, and sometimes he wants you to change your direction in life. Another one that came to mind, and to me the most significant one, was Paul himself. There's probably no more of a dramatic change in direction in a person's life than when Paul got knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus. This is profound. And with it, the Lord also granted him a physical hardship, a severe physical hardship. I mean, can it get any worse than one day you can see and the next day you can't? Or one day you can walk and the next day you can't. In my case, one day I could move and the next day I couldn't. And... Paul completely did a 180 and changed direction. Paul, why do you persecute me? Why do you... I, looked, I even looked it up in the Greek, Iris, and it says, why do you hound me? Why do you hound me? H-O-U-N-D. That's what it says in the Greek. And um, 
it's a very interesting section because there's a little verse there that is left out of some translations because it's in the Aramaic text, which is, why do you goad me? Or why do you goad the prick or something like that? It's some strange phrase, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's in the Aramaic. That's why it's not in all the translations. So I did my homework, Aris. I hope you're proud of me. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, I took this vision very personally like it was for me. Of course, that's never the case because we're all one body. And, and usually if the Lord gives me a message, it's usually something that I'm supposed to share for everyone. And that's true of you, too. The Lord will never give you something that's only for you. He'll, if he gives you something, some experience, something that has been revealed to you, it's so that you can share it. <laughs> um, it was very I have been procrast procrastinating about some things in my life that he and he was trying to give me the impetus to change direction and that's very clear to me now he's been telling me for weeks that I was going to ch be making a big direction change and the body of Christ needs to make such a correction a course correction also As I was sharing, there's a big difference between being excited and jumping around uh, in your emotion and being moved by the Spirit. Yes. There's a big difference between yes. pure religion, which is undefiled, and the religion of man. Because this whole bit with this religion of man, it's a course shift that the whole body of Christ needs to take. Away from being directed by the spirit of religion that's so prevalent in so many uh, fellowships and to be just in the spirit and be led by the spirit. The one man show is gone. It's over with. And it, it's gotta be it's gotta be body ministry. Um I'm supposed to share the scripture that says in the beginning that, that God said, Let there be light and there was light. I, I want you to know I was healed by sound waves. There is a vibration, and I'm trying not. I'm going to try not to make this sound new agey, but it's the sound, it's the vibration of of God's voice, which is the moving of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And it has energy in it. And there's energy in it. Healing yes. Energy. And there's yes. healing energy in it. Yes, there is. Jesus. Yes, there is. Not not only uh, not, now I'm getting tingles. Thank you, Nancy, for that. And I'm getting tingles after you said that. Hey. Not only. Is there a huge change in the spirit that we're on the verge of shifting? There's also a change that is about to happen on the face of the earth in regards to how healing is accomplished, even in the natural. And Thank this you, shift Jesus. is going to be with sound and light and vibration. Because these are the things that the Lord has truly given us. You know, you can't, you can't read, let there be light and have there be light. You have to say it. If you want to heal somebody, you can't pray quietly to yourself with your mouth closed. You've got to open your mouth because it's the vibration, the sound Jesus. that is the healing. You know, God spoke everything into existence. He didn't read it into existence. He didn't think it into existence. He spoke it. There was a sound, a vibration. Yes, it was. And isn't it interesting I found that in that Bible verse, he said let there be light. So light came into existence because of sound and vibration. Isn't that interesting? So if, you, if you've got bad musculoskeletal problems that no one else has been solved, talk to me later and I'll send you to the chiropractor. I can do. <laughs> <laughs> or how about pray with your mouth and it does it. Yes. Amen. Praying is great. <laughs> it is also Amen. Great. So um, that's what happened. When Jesus died on the cross, he incorporated us into his spirit and became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When he rises from the dead, we receive the innocence again.
again that yes. we had in the Garden of Eden because Jesus makes it possible. He was the propitiation for our sin. But we also receive the opening of our spirit, the new life, the potential in our spirits for every facet of the relationship Jesus had with the Father. Our lives are somewhat like a battery. Jesus is the positive pole, and we are the negative pole. And the impulse to do the will of God and love it comes from the positive pole. That is the message from the realm of the spirit. If we act upon the message that we receive, the negative pole, which is you and I, have received the spark and the arc is completed and not only is our flesh and our lives transformed to another degree into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we become transforming agents in the world itself. Yes. Amen. Amen. Hopefully we do become the breath and the word of God. That's the, that's the whole point of all this. Glory. What the Lord is about is moving us from one dimension of stuck, mm -hmm. us and the rest of the con congregations, moving us from where we are stuck into what we proclaim, which is glory, which is into what is ahead, not behind. There's no pattern for it except Jesus. And there's no way to it mentally first. It kind of comes up like this out of the Spirit. And all of a sudden you understand something. You may be reading a passage of Scripture you've read a million times, but all of a sudden something comes up out of your spirit and you see something you've never seen. We call that revelation knowledge. And both Cindy and I and Andrew and several teach out of that, preach out of that. But he has arrested me in the pull toward that which he desires for us to attain. But we cannot, and, and that's not even a really good word, but maybe it'll suffice for now. For us to conceive of even on this plane while we're humans and move us into those who see beyond what has been spoken by man in regard to what this book says. That doesn't mean correcting doctrine. What that means is moving beyond the doctrinal arguments into the vision for what his body is to be and do. And it's absolutely glorious. It's absolutely wonderful. And I know I'm only seeing bits and pieces as I move through. But most theology has to get dumped. I warn you in this. I'll warn everybody. Me and Louise. We got a lot of theology in us. Both of us. Most of it has to get dumped. And let me hear me. Hear me. What we believe about sin is not what's here. And we'll probably do a deep dive in the new year on the sin, what do we call it? Issue. The sin issue or the sin piece. Most of what we know about going to heaven is not what's here. Heaven and hell are not studied appropriately. We read the books of men instead. We start reading this book and we find out it's different than what we thought. So how could that become this? You see, I'm going to say a few things. We're going to be in, in Romans 14. I'm going to work just for a, a few minutes with things you already know. And if you don't know them, yet we need to come into a possession of them in our innermost being. All right? And... and um, 
She quoted them. Uh, Louise did. That was good theology, Louise. <laughs> There's a lot more to it, but that's a good theology, and that's basically the lesson. You see, when Abraham was made righteous, it was before he did anything right. Yes. And we have this phrase in four, if you go down, um, let's see, um, verse five. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In other words, and we know that, that chapter, and I think we're going to need to just go to that chapter, end of that chapter. The end of that chapter says uh, about Jesus, verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed or given to, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and who was raised again for our justification, or raised again for our righteousness, your translation may say. The word justice and the word righteous are synonymous in the Greek. We have two different concepts. The concept of just, justification is one that's legal. You've been justified before God on the basis of the work of Christ. Righteousness is his nature imputed to you, but it's all contained in the same word. So some of your translation says he was, he was crucified for our offenses, but he was raised for our righteousness. And we know we have been called the righteousness of God. We also know that the Lord did all of this for us from and before the foundation of the world in the mind of God. Yes, it happened literally on the earth 2,000 years ago. But in the mind of God, it was already in motion when he laid the foundations. The word is not before he created the world. That's not there. What? The foundation of the world. Before he threw down the seed of his creation is exactly the imagery that it is. Before he gave his life down and spoke the word, let there be light, you were in his bosom and had been there for eternity. He knew your name. He knew your person. Now I'm not teaching Calvinism. I'm teaching gospel here. Now he gave you choice in that knowing too. Part of you was a choice. Just like Adam and Eve. Part of you was a choice. But Romans 1 tells us that he revealed himself inside. Let's go to that. That's not on the notes. <laughs> yes Jesus. Romans 1. Romans 1, we begin with verse number 18. After he talks about, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ in verse seven, 16 and 17. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. It's, it's written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Men who become unrighteous, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice, because that which may be known of God is manifest or made plain. Hang on a minute. There we are. In, in them, for God showed it to them, for the invisible things or the formation of things in him and the foundation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Every person that's born, God has revealed to them he is God. You have to work at being an atheist or an unbeliever. So really, when you're bringing someone to Christ, you are just saying, come home. Because they belong with him. They're a product of him. In that sense, everyone is a son of God, but we're going to work with son of God in his understanding of son of God. We're going to see something here. You see, he has in mind... Now, Cindy did marvelous work with pattern from the old into the new. I, I want to work for a moment with pattern in the human being. You are the best example of the Trinity that can be made. You're three parts but one. 
If you want to know what the Trinity's like, we got God the Father who had the breath. We have Christ the Son who has the image, and we have, and the breath, of course, is the Holy Spirit. So we have three in one: spirit, soul, body. Now then, He meant to image you. He didn't just make you a man or a woman like Him. He put His likeness in you, and that's what He did with everyone. But unless the person receives Christ, all the judgments of the law rest upon them. They must receive Christ. That's the word. Agreed. But all was done beforehand. So we come to Christ. We say, yes, we receive Christ. And whoop, he gives us everything that it took Abraham about 25 years to get. He just did. Abraham received righteousness. On the minute you got saved, you received righteousness. You received godlessness. I mean godliness. You didn't receive sinlessness. Get it right, Iris. You received sinlessness. They're paying attention. They're paying attention. We're good. And the reality of it is he still sees you sinless. I often wondered why God didn't bring up Abraham's failure with Hagar. Or David's failure with Bathsheba. But do you know in the New Testament it's not even mentioned? Did you know in the New Testament the only thing about Abraham was, he, it's in chapter 4, he didn't falter in reference to the promise and he received. And I'm going, what? And you read faith chapter in Hebrews 11 and you'll find the only thing said about David is good stuff. Why? Because of the redemptive work of Christ. What counted was what they did in him, for him, for the kingdom. Those things weren't counted against them in eternity, so he doesn't bring them up in the New Testament. It's like us going to the altar to get forgiveness for our sin. And it's, it's one that we can't seem to get, get out of our heads, and we, we, we just can't seem to do it. And we say, Father, forgive us, you know, and he's saying, what? For what? Yes, amen. For what? If you've asked forgiveness for it once, guess what? It's he heard you. Now, there's, there's sometimes uh, I say, Father, I thought I need to go through this again. <laughs> and he'll go through it again with me. But he made you as he is even in a mortal form. For you are as he is. That's 1 John. I think it's 3, 7, 4, 17, 3, 17, 3 or 4. He made you just as he is. Now he didn't do that so that we can... I, I, I want to walk carefully here because there is so much ahead. So much ahead for here and for beyond. It just doesn't stop. It's like <sighs> bringing people to Jesus is something we do. It's like a body, uh, 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 we're married to Christ, so we have babies. But so often in the modern church, having babies is what our purpose is boiled down to. And that's only a very tiny part of it. Yeah. It's like my being Joe's wife, having children was a part of it. But it, my wifelyhood is still deeply needed 62 years later. The children are long gone. They're all in their 50s. I'm not that old, but they are. <laughs> so there's much more. He's made you his body. He's the head. We're the body. Now, we don't look like each other and we don't have the same things to do. As I said, this, the first part of it was undergirding what we already know. But you know the cells in my body don't look alike either. The cells in the fingernail don't look like the, 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 the cell in the eye. The same, the same cell, the same DNA, but they're made differently with different jobs. One size doesn't fit all. 
All right. Just so we get the body, the imagery of the body, the pattern of the body. It's get a hold of it. He's made you as he is. Now then, we can begin to move into something that God is really after. He's not after just getting you saved and bringing you to heaven. Now, that's okay, but that's not the point. The point is getting us in, back into his family where we belong. So we can mature in him to what we've been predestined to be. In May, Ephesians 1. This is easy. Again, you already know it, but you may not have thought this was your purpose. But it is, by the way, our purpose, according to the Westminster Catechism, <laughs> is to worship God and love him forever. The love him forever is accurate. The worship him is uh, an indicator of something that's not what he's indicating. We worship him forever. We love him forever. But that's not our main duty before God. Do you understand what I'm saying? As a, well, let's get this one first. Okay. Uh, According, verse 4, Ephesians 1, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined or determined ahead of time us into, and every, every translation but one says, adopt, as adoptions as sons or children. Children's not in there, adoption's not in there. The word adoption has nothing to do with our understanding of adoption in the West. I have adopted two children. They're now sons, sort of. You'll understand that in a minute. But we've adopted two children. They are not our blood. They had a whole history and they have a whole family in Vermont that we know nothing about much. They are, were in my care for 14, 15 years, and so we did behavior modification. But I, trust me, the world between the, my two natural born and my two adopted is a huge world because they don't have the same parentage. That's adoption. No one gets into Christ by adoption. Everyone has to be born into the family. Period. So you get born into the family as you were predestined. You get born into the family. And then it says, he's chosen you that from the foundation of the world. And what he's saying is that you should, that, that he predestined us. The part that's predestined is that we would grow up from being a baby and go to a son. Because this word is the adoption word is a Greek word, weothesia. It means son of God in place. Now, there are other places in the fifth chapter of, uh, in the, is it five? No, it's not five. Is it chapter 10? Talks about it. Of Romans that says, children of God, eighth chapter. Eighth chapter of Romans says, children of God separately, or child of God separately. But there's a vast difference in that chapter between children and sons. And let me give you the, the, the thing that I, <laughs> I held on to in my heart as I raised my children, hoping for, for three sons in the natural, right? Or actually four, because in, in the spirit there are no genders. So Lauren is definitely a son at this point. But... A son is somebody that when they become of age, I can hand my checkbook to. And they will make sure I'm taken care of out of that checkbook first. They're in place. It wouldn't surprise you to know that Lauren, since she's the, the one child that lives in town and actually has bought a house so we would have a place to live in our old age, that she's on every medical permission with Joe and I. As right. Why? Because she's son. She'll inherit anything in my house she wants first because she takes such care of us. So I'm saying to you, a son of God in place is what you've been predestined for. 
Now, Christ was a son of God, and he was the first among many brethren, right? You know these scriptures. So we are to attain, as it were, to grow up in Christ through the Spirit of God, to grow up way beyond the knowledge of the book, into the heart of the book, into the release of the book, into the doing what he did. Now, if you can take that concept, that gives you a taste of what's ahead. That's not all of it. Because, you see, when we go to the earth in our body, unless he chooses to transform me ahead of time, I would like that, I think. But that means I would continue to outlive everybody I know. And that's not something I really want to do. You understand what I'm saying? But there's, no, but there's a place where God's going to transform our bodies. And in fact, if, if we're alive when, when the time comes, and it's, he's going to come and receive us, but I'm not talking about that. There's a time before then that he's going to transform us into an immortal person. The people on the earth, Corinthians talks of this, the people on the earth will be immediately changed in the twinkling of the eye, and after... And that will happen after the dead are raised and their bodies are joined to their spirits. And we are with him in that cloud. Okay, getting ahead of myself. But anyway, we, we, have, we have stuff ahead in an immortal body, an uncorruptible body. It is a spirit first and a body after. Right now we're a body first and a spirit. You understand? The spirit is hidden. That will be a spiritual body, but there is... We are in time. It doesn't take us to a timely place, to a place of no time, because in order to have substance, you must have time. Or in order to have time, you must have substance. Either way. So our bodies will be knowable, touchable. We will be known as the sons of God, the weothesia, in place if we have grown and matured in spirit to the point that that is given to us. A calling comes to you. To mature in the spirit, to grow up in the things of God, move into a place even here of sonship. That means we begin to take charge of this earth. Wasn't the earth given to Adam? Have dominion over the earth. I didn't get, re I didn't get this from reading books. I got this from this book. You understand me? All right. We, have, we are to take dominion. When Christ came, he gave it back to us through the Spirit. That's why when I see something that I, is out of line, I need to begin to speak to it. <laughs> I was recently, back when the weather was good, at a camp for a few days on Owasco Lake. And I uh, really did enjoy myself. And, and was sitting out in the evening with a friend and the geese, not ducks, geese, flew into that part of the lake. The lake had been really beautiful and quiet. Really you could hear that you see the sunset and you could hear the birds. And in came the geese. Quack, 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 quack. Every everything. <laughs> And I said, all right, Lord, I'm son of God. Geese, you shut it up. Be quiet. <laughs> oh, my word. Hallelujah. It worked. I almost came in glued. <laughs> and so we talked to the, me and my friend talked a little bit longer, and they started, and I did it again. And as long as we were out there, that entire place was quiet. I said, I know that's a taste, and you let me do it for the convenience. We were talking the Lord. We were working in the Lord. I said, I know you let me do that to, to facilitate something, but we need to be where we are in the position of, and this is not heard of in most circles, where we're in the position of being trained by God to see beyond the natural and to do what his spirit is, do, says to do. Am I describing it right? He's a guy who agrees with me 100%. Yes. We need, to we need to have a vision of becoming. Becoming all that the Spirit wants us to be. 
so we can be what God wants us to be in the hereafter. Because he has stuff that he wants to share with us like an entire universe. Oh, Jesus, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. You see, getting saved is so step one. That's getting born. That's all that is. And then there is the training. Not only the training, what, what we've done pretty good with in discipleship. Pretty good, not too good. Because we haven't understand some basics. But, but we've tried to modify. It, it's, it's what we did with the boys. Behavior modification. We want them to act a certain way. We want them to think a certain way. We want them to be sure and give. We want them to do this and we want them to do that. And we train them in all these things that have nothing to do with the discipleship of being in the Spirit with Jesus. Now that doesn't mean we don't train them to be obedient before they know why. That's what we do with every child. They have to learn obedience before they end. In fact, I, I was a rare mom. My children were not allowed to ask why when I asked them or told them. They could later come to me and ask why. I'd be glad to share with them. But at the moment of instruction, it could be their life. So I always kept it where when I tell you to do something, you do it. Then talk to me later about it. I'll be glad to share. And I think God is glad to share. But when we know something to do it, even if we don't know the why, then we're quick to move on it. But it's different than just obedience for the sake of obedience. And we covered this in a uh, uh, deep dive last week. Is that w obedience out of the Spirit is very different obedience than I know I have to, so I will. It is an obedience that comes up from a relationship, which is where I'm going. Yes. Because this business of growing up to be a son of God or a weothesia, son of God in place, is the journey to know the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit intimately. Yes, yes. Intimately. Yes. More intimate than we have even dreamed. Yes. Prayers change. That's the first thing that changes. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I no longer approach him from the outside in, but from the inside out. Yeah. Right. Prayer changes. Our mind thoughts change as to the effectiveness of what we see him asking us to be and do. Our behavior will eventually change. It will be marked by making sure others shine. It will be marked with the leadership of Jesus when he said that in the world men will dominate over you. The Gentiles do that, but in my kingdom it shall not be so. So instead of being critical and put down, we will find ourselves in a position to love and uphold. Love and train in the same servant ways that the Lord is training us. It op operates very differently than anything we've been exposed to at all. So that we come into an intimacy. It's He's not, how can I say this, Lord, and not be misunderstood? He's not wanting me because of the influence I have through the ministry, large or small. He wants me because he loves me. And he knows what he put in me. And he wants that to him. And wants that deeply and we began to you know I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on prayer that gave me anything about God I didn't already know you know he's good you know he's everywhere you know you know we believe in healing so we believe in healing we go that way we believe in a lot of things but our prayers as we move forward should be those that are telling about a God that other people don't know. You know? If we're going deeply, it's not just about teaching them what he's done. Not anymore. It becomes about teaching who he is. 
Who is he? And as our intimacy, you got really still and quiet. I feel it in the spirit. You were already quiet, but ah, okay. Intimacy goes beyond any normal understanding of spirit to spirit in such a way that we learn the imprint of the heart of God. His mind is already ours through Christ. We begin to learn that imprint and we begin to move with him. He doesn't want you doing anything by yourself. He does it with you. You're part of the body. So whatever you do, he does. Whatever he says, you say. Andrew told us that. So we, we, that should guard us in a way. But as we move as human beings into a likeness that is deeper than just what I've thought, you see, he needs us to be receptors of his wisdom. He needs us to be receptors of his nature. He needs us to know, oh, God's like that. Mm, he will make me like that. Now, some might say, well, you think you're God's. I am, a son, I am son of God. I am a son of God. I have grown up. I have more growing to do. But he has in mind me becoming as he is. Yes. And then when all of that is done, when we're immortal, and he has all these grown up people with wisdom that he's trained while they were still mortal, with bodies now immortal. He can send us where he wants to do what he wants. There's so much ahead, beloved. Our lives are not our own. We have signed on to a family that is literally beyond anything we've ever imagined. We have to get rid of the petty. We have to get rid of the little. We have to get rid of evaluating things as we've always evaluated them. And we have to begin to move through the scriptures We'll never leave the scriptures behind. We're standing on the scriptures, but every vision we have that the Spirit interprets, there's always, as, as Andrew did, he, he cited two examples in scripture that there it is, there it is. Since the Spirit is in you, the Lord has no trouble talking with you, and I know most of you know that. He has no trouble talking with you. He has no trouble... <laughs> communicating with you. And if you don't get it, well, then there's the two before. <laughs> Which our brother described quite aptly. Yeah, the two before. You know. Oh, I didn't tell the story about the donkey. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> it's a good story. It's a good story about the donkey. Yes, okay. All right, let me finish and then you can tell the story about the donkey. <clears throat> so, what I felt deep within me and I, I didn't, my notes didn't help. Thank you, Jesus. I am such, you know, the, the guy in Peanuts that's Linus. Now, I take showers. Don't worry about that one. But he has a blanket. What does that blanket do for him, Linus? Comfort. Comfort. Yeah, he wraps up in it. When he, when he doesn't quite know what's going to happen, and so he feels comforted. Linus blanket. <laughs> and I've known for a long time, that's a Linus. He lets me do it. It doesn't mean we do it. Because. But I knew what he had in mind. I just couldn't figure out how to write it down. He's good. He just moves and he wants to move us into now you see all the all the sayings of the Lord don't lose hope don't lose hope keep moving forward because there's so much more to be had than what we've ever thought we thought we just needed to behave ourselves so we'd go to heaven well I'm going to be studying deeply in in heaven and hell and and timeless understandings uh, the understandings are timeless. The, the, the reality is not timeless. So just, just as we go on further, we're going to just go on further. We're going to allow the Word to uncover things that we've accepted since childhood that are quite different than what we thought. 
Very different than what we thought. And it's so good. It's so good. So let's not stay in the elementary. I know you're not, or you wouldn't be here. You're hungry. You want that which he has for you, and it's so much more than is being talked about anywhere. Now, I don't listen much to what's on, on the, the web or things like that in terms of sermons. I have only a few that I will listen to because they're pointing forward. They're not, they're not dealing in everyday kind of thing. I don't, I don't listen to those. Only because where we are going... Our behavior is something that we've, we've, we've done how-tos about for years. Now, instead of doing how-tos about behavior, how about us going solidly into the Spirit of God on a daily basis? Now, call it private time, quiet time, whatever time you want to call it. But the time you have with Jesus, at first it'll seem like nothing is happening. You do your reading, it, 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 it. and you'll think, well, nothing's really happening. The Lord's not really speaking. But if you'll be patient long enough, if not today, tomorrow, he doesn't make you wait. He lets you get used to his presence wherever you have your private time with him. He lets you enjoy his presence, and then he begins to drop things into you and you know oh that's good that, that's really sweet thank you Jesus one of the things Jesus nearly always says to me and I, I have a prayer journal that sometimes I write my prayer in to him just not everything I need not things like that he already knows that I said prayers change <laughs> you go beyond what he knows you know he knows into what he really knows but anyway the I write them and then I I use a black pen and then I, I change to blue so I'll know when I look back who's talking. And he, he usually calls my name, though I know he will change it. You know, we all get a new name, so that's, uh, that's okay. I haven't asked him what that one is. What's probably, that? I haven't asked him what that one is. I probably, new name is? my new name, we'll yeah. Huh? <laughs> What's that? We'll talk, about, we'll talk about it, okay. But I do know that the words of heaven are not always capable of being understood on earth. Um, you remember Paul had a vision, first, Second Corinthians 12, he had a vision, the third heaven, but he couldn't talk about it. And there's some indication in that word that, that it wasn't because he was told not to, it was because he couldn't say what it was. He didn't have the words. There are no words. Yeah. There are no words of heaven's words, but none. And if, when you read the book of Revelation, if you'll throw out the timeline and start reading it to hear the Lord, you will find often that um, John, as he writes, it says it was like. He doesn't say it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was like because there are no words to describe what John the Revealer saw. There will be no words often for what you will see and what you will know. But that's okay. Because that's part of moving forward. And you wait till he drops the understanding in. But you see, he's the God of the moment, but he's also the God of eternity. And we're involved in eternity. So as we grow and as we move, let's go forward in that fullness. Lord, I thank you for each one. In the sound of your voice through me today and through the camera and all who will listen, that we will hear the word of the Lord and as we read your word we will not come at it with a pre-gone conclusion and we will settle into what you're saying not what we've been told you said as adults with ready minds we long for your spirit to show us what is true and we long to move with you in it as a um, an eagle flying high not as someone having to climb a mountain but as an eagle in our spirits flying with you to the sights that only you know to show us I thank you Lord Jesus and I bless you thank you Jesus in his name yeah. thank you for sharing this time of unfolding the word 
We welcome your questions and comments about this program, either by mail at Psalm 19 Ministries, 6138 South Salina Street, Syracuse, New York, 13205, or by email at Psalm19Ministries at gmail.com. More information can be found by visiting Facebook or our website at Psalm19.org. Again, thank you for watching Unfolding the Word.